All right, I'm delighted to say that Adam Hurry has joined me on the line. Now, Adam, thanks for joining me. No problem. So a lot of people will know you from your book that came out a couple of years ago, Football Clichés. A lot of people will know you from your Twitter account, which you pretty much constantly tweet. I don't know how you keep it up. And now, <laughs> uh, now a lot of people will know you from your new podcast on The Athletic as well. So you're a busy man, essentially, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, it's not hugely difficult to juggle all of those things, I'd say. I, did, I, I didn't realise I was such a prolific tweeter. I think sometimes I look at um, the number of tweets that other people have sent and I just think, thank God I'm nowhere near that level. Um, I think it's just because I just, I just don't, um, I don't get involved in uh, horrendous debates with people, which keeps my tweet count down. But, um, but yeah, but yeah it essentially is an addiction, I suppose. Yeah, it's it's more off the fun side of Twitter where uh, the the thing I I wasn't going to get into this right now, but the posted the thread of the images that look exactly like I, they came straight out of a game has mm. had me completely addicted to watching <laughs> bits of football that look exactly like a game. I don't know where you I like. I think the great thing about it is that a lot of people would have had the. Th- these thoughts as well and thought they were the only people but now that you're giving them that platform as well uh i mean i like to think that's kind of um central to the spirit of of most things i i try and do but um the problem with that particular thread is that is that i haven't actually played um fifa since about 2012 i haven't played football managers or, or even championship managers since, since about 2004 so it, it gets to the point now where most of the suggestions for this thread are, are way over my head like there there they're are sort of scenes of p- players walking out of tunnels or or in offices and stuff and I just think oh, that's not in the game that I remember so I, I kind of have to di- so the thread is essentially dead because my my kind of cultural experience of computer games is about 10 years old so um yeah I think it might have run its course unfortunately well it was it was definitely one of my favorites when I was going anyway but <laughs> I, I mentioned that you had a book and now that you have a podcast so I do want to mm. talk to you about that sort of that change in the medium of which you get your football cliches out so the book came out a couple of years ago, right? It was, oh, so it was about six years ago, yeah. in fact, originally. Yeah. And it was, it was really brilliant. And now you've brought that to the radio platform, the podcast platform with Athletic. How have you found that sort of change? How have you found being able to translate it across? I, I, think, I think it's a really handy way of doing it. I mean, by nature, some of the stuff I like to talk about is the moment you put it into a written word, if you printed it, it would, it would just take on a significance that it just doesn't deserve. I'm, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with tiny little innocuous things in football, which when you add, when you look at them in isolation, they are, they are so unimportant, but when you add them all together, they're still incredibly unimportant, but they all add up to what our experience of football is kind of subconsciously. Uh, it's not like I'm trying to tap into people's psyche or anything. I just, I just like pointing out things that people take for granted. Um, you know, that aren't particularly serious. Um, so in that respect, it's really good for a podcast because you can talk about these things really informally without worrying about how you're going to phrase it and send it to an editor and then let it sit there for people to read for in, until the end of time. Um, so I think podcast is, is, is a really kind of handy way of expressing a lot of these things. At the same time, I was very conscious that in, in 2020, um, there are a lot of football podcasts. It was similar to when I first started my blog back in sort of the mid two thousands. There was a lot of football blogs back there, and I thought, am I just am I just adding to the pollution here? Um, you know, is there really a place for this? And uh, luckily, I think there is. Um, you know, there are a lot of football podcasts that I listen to. Um, which kind of detail what's happened in the last few days, which is incredibly important because, you know, there's so many talking points and people like to live in the present. But my aim for this podcast was to provide a kind of evergreen look at tiny things in football that people could listen to again in three or four years time and it would still make sense then. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's just nice to have that kind of back catalogue of stuff. Yeah, and I suppose the brilliance of it is that with The Athletic, you obviously have a whole host of brilliant journalists and talent within the ranks of The Athletic, but it's not just exclusive to that. You can bring in comedians who like to talk about football and kind of get the understanding of what the podcast is and it, it the dynamic yeah. of it works. I hope so. I mean, um, as you say, I mean, the, the athletic is such a vast array of, of talented people that I can call upon. And, uh, and uh, usually they're, uh, they usually they are quite busy, at least I certainly hope so. But um, there's always someone at a loose end who wants to come in and talk about football. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just nice to get a, a variety of people in, to talk about their experiences of niche aspects of football, because we all, we all pick up on different things. I'm, I'm not saying I'm across all of this, but, and, but it does take a certain type of football fan to care about these tiny little things, because my podcast will never be about 
uh, you know, whether a manager's under pressure um, based on the results of the last week or whether this club hates this club or this set of fans hate this set of fans. Um, it's not that I feel like I'm above the tribalism uh, at all. I, I still feel it somewhere in my heart, I'm sure. But um, I just... I just really like the tiny little things in football because we watch so much of it and we read about it all the time that I'm convinced that there are some things that, that go over our heads a little bit. But when we actually sort of focus on them, we just think, wow, yes, that happens. That is weird. And I'm not saying it's earth shattering. I just think it's interesting. And, um, and fundamentally, it's quite a selfish pursuit because if you pick something that nobody else cares about or doesn't realise they care about, then you are immediately, by default, the world expert in it. And that's the mm-hmm. huge appeal about this. And I, I suppose football commentary would be one of those things that I yeah. literally cannot unhear certain things. When I hear them now, it drives me mad when I just have the t- TV on. And, uh, well, like, minute, like um, well, there's, there's a couple of examples that I, I do want to get into a little bit later on. But okay, okay. I suppose one of, the, one of the key ones for me, and it's a, it's a pet peeve of mine, is when a reporter or a, a football commentator says um, he knew exactly what he was doing there. Mm. Well, of course he did. Yeah, he did. But that's a, that's like a distant cousin of um, uh, certain players. You, they're, they're so unpredictable. Even they don't know what they're going to do next. <laughs> um, I mean, commentary, football commentary, and kind of interviews and things like that were always going to be the first port of call for cliches when it first started in terms of picking apart the language of football. And there was always a, there was always a danger, and there still is, to be honest, of, of looking like we're being quite mean and condescending and picking easy targets, which sometimes sometimes it is. Um, but I, I always insist, and I, and I know this sounds like a cop-out, but it's, this is always done with a huge amount of affection. Um, if, a, if a footballer, for example, is in an interview and he says a classic, phrase a classic cliche that I almost feel like they feel that they have to say then I don't blame them for it it's because it's learned behavior and it's something they've seen other players do and and that's how and that's how they communicate and with this overarching rule that there's because there's so much coverage of football like an unbelievable amount of coverage probably excessive let's face it it gets to the point where there is only so much you can say about football there's only so many ways you can describe what's happened and talk about it so there will always be that caveat um, when, when a commentator or a player utters a cliche, it's because that phrase or word is doing it a better job than anything original that they could ever come up with. So I will always defend cliches. I think, I think most of the time they're really good things. If you even want to provide an opinion on it, most of the time I'm quite neutral about it. So they're not terrible. I mean, the definition of a cliche is fairly negative. It, it says it betrays a lack of original thought. Mm. But as I say, there is only so many ways you can be original when you talk about football. So we will always circle back to cliches and we all use them without a shadow of a doubt, as I've just done. Yeah, and I suppose rugby would be a sport that people give out about the jargon and the Mm. language and the work-ons and the playing it through the lines and and the way that they describe it. But I suppose rugby is such a limited sport and what you can do, so there's a limited way that you can describe it. And I suppose when football, when you're describing it, it's been around for so long that yeah. these phrases are just part of the language now and you can't really blame someone to you when they use it because again completely like you agree. said it's just part of what the sport is now yeah i completely agree well rugby is rugby is an interesting example because um uh i used to work at the telegraph and i i, I used to sit alongside um, a few of the rugby writers and I, I know next to nothing about rugby i could i could tolerate it I'm, i will happily watch one of the big games and, and understand what's going on and that's about my limit of my appreciation of it um, but when you pick any other sport um, like that, the, every sport is going to have its set of cliches and phrases and, 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 and its kind of language that everybody uses. But when you're sat on the outside, you begin to appreciate that language even more because you have that sense of detachment. So when I was reading their articles and I was talking to them about rugby, I was thinking, OK, well, I've, I've almost got this kind of um, critical distance here where I can examine the language that they use. And as it turned out, rugby is full of, a lot of technical language. It's almost a little bit more towards NFL and American sports where, where technical jargon dominates completely. Whereas football is a lot to do, a lot more to do with the kind of vague sentiments that we all just think, oh, yeah, I guess that kind of works. I think I understand what that means. But there are sports where, where technical jargon kind of overtakes and that's, and that's what counts for their cliches. But um, it's all fine. It's, it's all absolutely fine. And, and in, in, if anything, technical jargon helps someone like me who doesn't really consume the sport very much get into it a little bit more easy so cliches come in handy in so many different ways 
Yeah, they help you pretend that you know what you're talking 100%. about when someone brings it up at the pub. That's exactly so, what they're for. Can, can we give you credit for pointing out Frank Lampard's post-match interviews? Is that, uh, Definitely. Like, yes. <laughs> Jesus. If there's, if there's one thing I've, I've achieved in this um, pathetic existence, it's pointing out that, that Frank Lampard makes a serious point, then he laughs, makes a lighthearted point, and then makes a serious one again. Um, you know, by, by no stretch of the imagination am I saying that this is exclusive to Frank Lampard, and nor am I saying that this is some sort of... Um, uh, incredible moment of uh, human evolution. It's just, um, I just, I just, it's the consistency of it that I really like, and and loads of players and managers do it. And um, and I, I'm, if anything, I'm kind of noticed that there's there's this strand of England player from the mid to late two thousands who are all doing it in their now management interviews. And um, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're teaching it in the way for pro license. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, like I, I was watching, I don't, I'm not sure if you've come across Connor Sketches, the guy who does the, the golf yes. impressions. It's, he does it now when he's doing his Frank Lampard. That's how, that's how far this has developed. His Lampard is incredible. Yeah, it's um, so consistently um, good, like Lampard's post-match interviews. Yeah, I mean, impressionists across the board are a, a variable uh, level of accuracy. But... Um, his Lampard is, is superb and it's, it's just, it is just those little things. And uh, when he uses that um, the kind of Lampardian transition, as I like to call it, as, as the device for his impression, it, it is really good. It's, it's the little kind of nervous, kind of rushed chuckle that Lampard does. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it, it's, not, it's not a serious thing and it's, it's not, uh, uh, not going to impact on his career whatsoever, but it, I'm... So, so delighted that the uh, people are picking it out because it's um, it's something that we are forced to consume. We are forced to listen to managers talk um, every week, so we might as well enjoy a little bit of bit of it while we can. While we're on the subject of managers, is there anything else that you're noticing at the minute that current managers use, or a specific tick of any manager in the Premier League right now? Uh, good question. Um, I think generally, I'm I'm fascinated by the rise of the phrase "in a good moment." which is a very rare example of a phrase which, I mean, so much um, in English football language kind of goes into, into wider society. People use kind of football analogies and very little comes back in. But this is an even more obscure example because this is an example of a phrase that foreign players and managers were using as they learned the English language. And then it became on, so in vogue that English people would start using their kind of secondhand English themselves so in a good moment um whilst it isn't grammatically a disaster it's not a, it's not a phrase that english people tended to use it, it was a very it was a kind of very awkward way of expressing at you know at the moment but saying yeah. in the moment and um it was people like sort of gary cahill in a chelsea interview which would, would use it and i was saying wow that that that's it's so incongruous that english people would start using that phrase and it's just crept in because as with most football cliches, people start to get on board with it and think, well, Jadge, do you know what? This does the job of what I'm trying to say. So after all, it's actually a perfectly good phrase to use and I've completely um, come around to it. Um, so, it, you know, it is always interesting how language evolves, but it, sometimes it can happen incredibly quickly. Yeah, and that's a phrase that Klopp would use quite a bit and Pep Guardiola as well. well on the subject of football reporters, because I know you, you do a sort of a thread on, on Twitter where you have social media accounts that post certain scores and use certain phrases and you mm. adjudicate whether it was correct or wrong. Um, so, terrible, so, isn't it? I, don't, I, I feel guilty now. You've, <laughs> now you've explained it back to me. I feel terrible and I'm going to stop doing it immediately. Uh, no, please don't. So in, okay. uh, in the radio landscape, I'm not sure what they have in England, but we have IRN football reporters. So they're the guys that phone in from the football stadiums and give you the yeah. score. And without taking the piss out of these guys, because it is something that, we talk about but it seems like they were born with their names they were born to be football reporters so yes. i i have a couple of, i have a couple of football names that do the reports for us and you have mm-hmm. nigel bidmead adam jury yep. guy swindells darren stanage andrew Cheel. these guys it was almost like when they were given their name at birth their parents knew immediately they were going to be those football reporters 100 percent. what was the first name that you said there it was nigel bidmead nigel bidmead is is about as football reportery a name as you can get. I mean, let's get into the real nuts and bolts of that. First of all, you know, very common first name, very common kind of fairly ageless, um, perhaps sort of middle-aged male name, done. Second name has to be two syllables, if possible. Um, a slightly 
unusual surname that you, you, you don't know anybody else who's got it, but yet it still feels like it should be quite a common surname. I mean, two fairly inoffensive, fairly vague sounding words stuck together that make a surname you've never heard before, <laughs> but yet it, should, it could easily be bought, uh, had by one million people. And then when you put those, all those things together, you have a football reporter's name. It's a bit like um, on Sky we, in, in the UK, we had Dave Brace Girdle, which is exactly the same principle. <laughs> Dave, normal name, Brace Girdle, Put those two things together, you have a name that nobody else has, and yet it sounds incredibly common at the same time. Perfect. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think Guy Swindells is my favorite one because <laughs> it's just, it's just so perfect. I don't know why it is, but it it, it just is. And th- I mean, these guys are brilliant reporters. There's no doubt about yes, it. But again, 100%. they were born with that name, and that 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 gave them immediate head head start. So I'd love to have a name that just says. Um, and, and here is X, Y, and Z at Stadium Stadium X. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I'd just love to have a name like that. I feel like I don't have a football reportery name. I wish I did. I had the pleasure of reporting at a Crystal Palace, um, who was Crystal Palace Brighton at the end mm-hmm. of the season last year. And I just don't have the name. End of call at the, it was, was it? You don't have enough Palace? syllables. Let's face no, it. I, I no, I don't. It, 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 it just didn't sound right. So immediately they canceled the show at the end of the season <laughs> after, I'd, after I'd reported. So that, that is that, a form of discrimination, uh, <laughs> I would say. I was, I was the nail, final nail in the coffin. Um, when I said <laughs> to the guys in the office that you were coming in, I asked them to send, because we, we talk about this all the time, just yeah. this, different phrases. So I got them to send in a couple of phrases, if you don't mind, we'll, uh, to go through them with us. So yeah, let's do it. one of my favorites and one that rolls around every single year is he, he's got the war chest out. At what stage <laughs> in the transfer window does it become a war chest? Is it, is it, is it 50 to 100 million? Is it 100 to 200 million? What defines a war chest? Hard to know these days. I mean... Up until relatively recently, I guess you could attract it with, in, with inflation. But now COVID's come in; it's hard to know what a, a war chest constitutes. I mean, I mean, on a very mundane technical point, no one gets their war chest out. You have to have a war chest handed to you. Yeah, that's fair. Um, you, you know, you, ne- you never have ownership of your own war chest. You must you must be given it by the powers that be. Um, but I would say, generally speaking, over the last ten years or five to ten years, I'd say it's a minimum of fifty million at Premier League level. You're looking at 50 million. Anything less than that is maybe a kitty, mm. possibly. But 50 million is the minimum for a war chest. And then I don't think there's a maximum limit for a war chest because there's nothing bigger than a war chest. Yeah, it's just, yeah. 50, 50 seems about right because you get might get one average centre midfielder in the Premier League for that amount these days. Yeah, I, I, maybe the threshold is it needs to be enough money to sign... M- at least two players who will make a difference to your squad and probably come in and make an impact in your first team. Uh, you, know, you can't spend a war chest on one player, for example. No. Because um, yeah. that, that's, that's not enough. So, uh, yeah, so minimum of two players, and I guess 25 million as a starting, starting price seems sensible. So 50 minimum. So the two of these kind of roll into one each other. Um, he hit it and it stayed hit. And, oh, nice. Uh, if anything, he's hit it too well. Oh, yeah. The two of them are probably the same, but similarly, they're used differently. Well, and firstly, for stayed here, it's it's just it's just perfect. It's 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 a phrase that. You know, scientifically, logically does not work. (laughs) Um, And, you know, let's get that out of the out of the way straight away. But secondly, it, it fills your head with an image that so perfectly fits what it is they're trying to describe from a from an aesthetic perspective, you, you take a shot that slams into the, into the top corner in a lovely straight trajectory, then the phrase, it stayed hit, fills every football fan with a certainty of what that shot looked like. And, and that's, the, that's the power and the beauty of the, of the English footballing language, is that certain phrases will, be, will have such a universal image in everybody's head of what happened. And uh, so stayed hit is perfect. Now, the second one, if anything, he almost hit that too well. Uh, it's a phrase I've talked about quite a lot because there's so many layers to it. Um, it's something a co-commentator will usually say because it's, um, it has so many characteristics of co-commentary. First of all, you take the, um, the element of if anything, uh, which is meaningless. So you, you, we don't need, even need to be saying those words at all. If anything just means if I absolutely had to call this and I have to because it's my job. So that's what they're saying. He's almost... So I haven't quite committed to this opinion, but I'm going to say it anyway, because if I actually did commit to it, it would be even more weird than what it's about to be. So let's get that out of the way. He's hit it almost 
too well. And now, and if you get to the, now we get to the point where we have to understand what too well means. And for years I thought, Maybe it means like a shot that's flown over the bar, looks really, really nice, and there is sort of lovely rocket style trajectory, but it didn't go in. And I've since amended my opinion about this. I think it's a shot that that does similar kinds of things. It's a very nice, nicely hit, struck shot, but it goes straight at the goalkeeper. When if he'd scuffed it or sliced it, it probably would have gone in. So I you know, the more I talk about it, the more I realise that the phrase is absolutely perfect. Mm. It means exactly what we want it to mean, despite the fact if you gave it to a linguist or an English literature graduate, they'd be like, this is nonsense, you can't say this. Yeah, yeah. I think it it's very much, if it's like from the six-yard box and instead of hitting it into the ground and bouncing over the keeper, he actually connects with the ball mm. the way that he should, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, he, and probably quite satisfying to do so, but yeah, it didn't go in. On the, if anything, he hit it too well, one phrase that has creeped into the office, and I'm, I'm not aware of anybody using this outside of the three people that I speak to in the <laughs> office, um, and it sort of it coincides with the influx of VAR decisions. Um, one of the guys came up with, the, uh, he's given it, and it stayed gived. Stayed gived? Yeah. It makes um, absolutely no sense, but it does make sense, because you, when a decision is given now, you're not really mm. sure whether or not that decision is going to be the concrete decision. So he's given so we, it and it's stayed give. It's stayed give. Um, I, the beauty of that is I just simply don't know what tense that is in. And, and, that, <laughs> and that kind of lends itself to the kind of time and space bending qualities of VAR. We just don't know what moment we find ourselves at any stage. Um, we're just in a constant state of re reviewing something that happened 15 seconds ago. So in, in that sense, stayed gived works perfectly. Uh, I, might, I might start introducing it into my day-to-day football language. Uh, so we'll, thanks to whoever invented that. We'll uh, take 5% commission charge for that. And for, for <laughs> yeah. the idea. What, just on the subject of VAR, while, while we were on it, have you noticed anything creeping into the game since VAR came in in terms of phrases and language and the way that we talk about it? Um, I mean, there is so many debates around about the current state of the laws of the game. I'm, I'm increasingly tired of seeing people whinging about toenails and, and kind of t-shirt lines and things like that in in a kind of this derisory way that suggests that these things have no place in football. Now I completely understand the spirit of what it is they're trying to say. You know, we, we, football should flow and we shouldn't care about these tiny little things, but it's kind of unavoidable. And, um, and you know, I'm kind of of the opinion that a toenail offside, once you get used to it is no more, is no better or worse than having a foot offside or a knee offside, or perhaps even your entire body. Um, these little margins shouldn't really make any difference compared to each other. So it is, it's this kind of, um, if we are going to take, I mean, I, I'm not being super serious about VAR here. I, I'm not going to talk to you for an hour about VAR. But if we do want to have a serious debate about VAR and its effects and and its future and whether it really works or not, we actually have to. We do have to talk about it seriously. You can't just be sarcastic about toenails. You can't be sarcastic about um, you know millimeters and things like that. Um, this is what football is now. And if we want to talk about VAR seriously and fix it, then you have to stop being sarcastic about it. In some cases, it is very funny when a team is denied goals by VAR. And we're all going to have that schadenfreude at one point or another. Um, but you know, to reiterate the point, if you want to take VAR seriously and, and fix the problem, then we have, to, we have to kind of stop talking in this kind of cliched you know, faux dismay about it and just, and just either accept it for what it is or constructively rip it apart. I would happily do the latter any day. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where we're going to end with VAR at the, the end of the season. Um, I suppose one thing that I've noticed creeping into the game, and I suppose, I'm not sure how English football journalists feel about this, but it's certainly a, an opinion in Ireland anyway that English players are talked about a little bit differently than, than, than foreign players. And Harry Kane would be one of them because one thing that people have started seeing now is Harry Kane, the thing where he backs into the player when he's yeah. going up for a header and gets it. And, and some people call it clever. So what's the difference between a player who is clever and mm. a player who goes down easily and wins fouls? Um, I, I, would, I would probably suggest that there is still this kind of lingering um, reluctance to suggest that English players are indulging in the dark arts. And it's, it's kind of, it's a bit like, it's kind of like a hangover that relates to English players not being technically brilliant 
and and we're we're slowly getting used to the idea that an English player can play a pass and and have a decent first touch uh, after years of just watching England teams not knowing what to do with the ball. So we're slowly coming around to the idea that we we could produce English players who are technically good. Mm-hmm. Now, along with that, if if we are to trace it along the same way that we used to judge foreign players when they first came to the Premier League. Um, we are slowly coming around to the idea that English players might have that kind of extra layer of cynicism in their head. You know, for, for, you know if you go back a century ago, we, um, English teams were, took huge pride in their sportsmanship. It, it became comical how, how much pride they took in sticking to the rules and, and t- sticking to the spirit of the game, the Corinthian spirit, as we called it. And um, there's still a hangover from that. And, it, and uh, the idea that someone as upstanding as Harry Kane could be bending the rules to his will or even, or even, you know, adding an air of kind of extra cynical physicality to his game. It's hard for people to accept. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it, but we should embrace it. I mean, it's, if you take out the, um, the possibility that he might be doing your team a disservice in a game, then overall it's probably a good thing that English players are taking on that level of cynicism because that's how teams succeed. That's how you become good at football is by being a bit of an asshole. And Harry Kane has a lot of margin for error for that because he yeah. seems to be a very, very nice man. He's, he's a clever player as they, as yeah. to, to shorten it. When does a player become that type of player? Do you know, <laughs> do, do you know when yeah. he's not that type of player, but... Well, they're so conspicuous by their absence, as the phrase goes. Um, mm. No one ever wants to be that type of player. No one will ever self-identify as that type of player, let alone have their manager identify them as that type of player. Um, but I guess, you're, I mean, if we're looking at it as a kind of a threshold, you need to, you're probably looking at at least three high-profile horror tackles before you start to become known as that type of player. Um, before that, it's just wrong place at the, at the wrong time, I'd say. When you become that type of player, is is that he's got that in his locker, or is that a different? Oh no, you can't have bad things in your locker. No, it's good. Um, things, lockers it? are exclusively good, creative, attacking things, or maybe even in like a defender who has a sort of knack for scoring at corners, or uh, maybe a set piece specialist or something like that. But you can never have a bad thing in your locker. Um, uh, but I guess you know, related to that, it's it, I remember for most of Wayne Rooney's career, whenever he did something aggressively terrible, people always used to say, well, if you took that out of his game, he wouldn't be the same player. So I guess that's where you could squeeze in negative traits. When does a player become that man? <laughs> I, I love this. That's, that's one of my, that's one of my, yeah. my favorites is that man. And I think it, it's pretty much exclusively to strikers. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Or maybe sort of attacking midfielders who have a bit of a knack for goal scoring. But um, yeah, there's a kind of hierarchy to this. That man, I guess, it, it, um, there's a kind of a formula for this. Um, so we're talking about strikers who are on a bit of a goal scoring streak. That's, that's a fundamental principle mm-hmm. here. But I also think that there's an element of kind of sh- a novelty and surprise about it. So you, couldn't, it, you wouldn't use it for Aguero, for example. We're accustomed to Aguero scoring in six games in a row. We're, we're accustomed to Harry Kane scoring 30 goals a season. So Harry Kane and Sergio Aguero will never be that man. It will never be who else but Harry Kane because we already are, they've already elevated themselves to the place where we assume that they will score. Yeah. So the classic example from the last few years was when Glenn Murray went on a kind of goal scoring streak for, for Brighton. And it, and there are, there are so many examples of, of goal scoring streaks from strikers like him who we know are capable, but yet, are, we aren't accustomed to at Premier League level scoring regularly. And uh, there are so many players who start, like Puki last season for Norwich, who went on a, a decent goal scoring streak at the start. Not spectacular, but just very, very good. So he qualified for that man status. So I would say maybe you're looking at three goals in five games, six in eight, something like that kind of ratio. And especially if they're kind of winning goals or in high profile or against high profile op- opponents. And then once you've passed that stage, once it starts to become a regular occurrence that you're scoring these goals, but you're still a fairly unknown quantity or an unfancied quantity, then you become who else but. Mm. So it's who else but Glenn Murray. And, and then, yeah, that's kind, of, um, that's kind of the hierarchy of it as far as I'm concerned. I'm overanalyzing it, but that's exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, Glenn, Glenn Murray is the poster boy for that man. Yeah, 100%. Because you know he can 
he can go on that run. But he, mm. that man, Glenn Murray, just rolls off the tongue. Before we finish up, there's a couple more we want to get through to. So um, a good time to score is one that has, has been sent into us. When, when is a good time to score? Because really any time is a good time to score. But Well, just before half time, yeah. because um, that's, that, that's where you land your psychological blow. On the Change the team just, So just before... Yeah, so I mean, just before half time is considered to be an incredibly good time to score because that, that changes the complexion of the game and it means that your manager is going to have something entirely different to say at half time. Uh, but of course, I mean, it does raise the question conversely, is there a bad time to score? And of course, you can score too early, um, which, 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 which is one of those sorts of football cliches that taps into the psychology of every football fan, which is pessimism. The idea that your team is going to completely screw it up at any given moment so even when your team score to be able to find a cloud within that silver lining is a very is a very football fan thing to do so to declare that your team have scored early and they're, they're still going to lose which is a pessimism i completely understand you know i i would i would happily bet against my own team every week because i think they're going to lose um so yeah it's, it's one of that kind of classic cliches that kind of it, it's people making a deal with fate Essentially, I knew this was going to happen. I'm therefore emotionally neutral about it after all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you, the manager ripped up the team talk after yes, they, exactly. they scored 42.3 minutes. <laughs> so the, these two kind of go hand in hand. So you would put uh, a ball into the corridor of an uncertainty mm-hmm. and you'd have the defense at sixes and sevens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the history of, but I mean, I'm not big into kind of the etymology of, of some of this stuff. It's not really my area of interest, but both have fascinating stories. Um, Corridor of uncertainty is, is the rare phrase that we we've, we've stolen from cricket uh, and uh, cricket fans always get slightly angry about this declaring that we, you know, we had it first, it was ours, which is fine. And it works perfectly in cricket, but it also works perfectly in football. And again, is one of those phrases where if I, if I said it to you, you would instantly know not only the, the area of the pitch that I'm talking about, but the scenario that I'm talking about, kind of like a whipped cross or a driven cross that goes, goes into that very, very doubtful area between where the goalkeeper is rooted to the spot and where a striker is sliding in. And it, and it just, it's, it, it is very poetic and, uh, and football language isn't always, but it works perfectly. And as for sixes and sevens, um, it's a hugely debated history. Um, some suggest it's uh, to do with a, like a medieval dice game called Hazard, where if you, if you rolled a, a six or a seven with your two dice, that was the worst thing that could happen. Um, I, I'm probably paraphrasing the rules of Hazard, but that's roughly what we're talking about. And there are, there are other theories. It's something to do with the, um, the order of precedence for the livery corporations in London back in the 16th century or something absurd like that. And if you were at six or seven, that was deemed to be a not a great place to be. Um, so some football phrases have a very very bizarre circuitous history to get to the 21st century and yet we're still using them and no one really questions where they came from which you don't really have to because you're just using them as a cliche but every now and then it's it's nice to kind of have a little pause and think why the hell are we saying these words they're nonsense Mm -hmm. COVID-19 and the coronavirus has obviously been such a serious time and Mm -hmm. a lot of cliches have come out of it like these un- unprecedented times and uncertain mm. times and mm. football coverage has changed vastly from what it was last season to what it is this season. Yeah. Do you think that we'll return to some sort of normality next year when we have fans back in, if we have fans back in, in terms of just we, we hit restart button and we go straight back into where we are? Or can you see a, a certain amount of things creeping into the game? Uh, I guess there's two things to say here. First of all, there's going to be a when when fans do properly return, like you know, all the restrictions are, are released and you can have thirty to forty thousand people back every week. There's going to be a short period of kind of celebration, um, in kind of over romanticism of, of football fandom. Um, it's some. It, I feel very. I, sh- I feel like I should be very careful talking about this because um, no one should ever. No one should ever do down football fans. But I, I also feel sometimes there's this, this kind of rose tinted idea of of what it means to be a football fan. And, and uh, I mean, back at the very, very start of lockdown when fans weren't allowed into football, this idea that without, fa- without fans, football is nothing, um, which, which really does my head in because it, cause it's, such a, it's such a pathetically sentimental thing to say when it re- kind of ignores the reality of, of, of a sport. A sport is about people who play it 
and the people who come and watch it are secondary. And I don't mean secondary in a, in a bad way. That's, that's the logic of it. Yeah. Sport is about playing, not watching. Uh, I'm, I'm just convinced by this. And I'm, I'm, I'm not being pedantic. I just think it's important that we remember that the most important people in the sport are the people who play it. Um, if fans weren't there and we were just playing it down the park, it would still be amazing. Football would still be brilliant. The quality of Sunday League football would be incredible if no one were going to stadiums and watching proper football. So um, maybe I am being pedantic about it, but there will be a period when fans get back about to everyone talking about how brilliant it is that fans are back. And that, and that obviously is a good thing. It's great that people will have that routine back in their lives. Um, but then after that, it will be amazing how quickly we all do go back to the routines that we had before um, fans booing fans saying how crap it is to be there and, the, and, and how terrible their teams are and they're fed up with them. And, uh, and, and that's in some ways very comforting and it will be good to see how that portion, that, that kind of corner of society, you know, reflects back to what they were doing before, because that's exactly what we all need. Of course it is. Whereas, um, you know, in wider society, there are, be, there are be things that are going to take decades to get back to where they were or decades to improve and return to normal. So um, I, I would be, I think everyone's going to be pleasantly surprised by how quickly football returns to what it was before, at least in a kind of, you know, day-to-day experience. Yeah, I completely agree. I think football is one of those things that just continuity is something that it does brilliantly. Yeah. And it, it'll, I do think, yeah, I, I agree with you. It'll be an initial celebration and we'll, within a couple of weeks, it was all, all, almost like when uh, everyone was so excited for the return of the Premier League at the very start mm. of this year. And mm. then they realized that, I think, was it West Brom and Crystal Palace were the first game back? And then 60 minutes in, it was nil-nil and people were like, yeah, this is exactly what I remember it to be. It's, it's been, a, it's been a, I mean... The absence of crowds and, and the, the concept of fake crowd noise on TV, which is such a bizarre concept. I mean, I, I, I have to have it. I feel like mm. I have to have it on my broadcast. If I've, if I've got the option, I would, I would have the crowd noise because I feel like I need it in the background as a kind of subconscious comfort to what I'm watching. And I, and I, I understand why people think it's, it's soulless to, be, to have games without crowds. Of course, it adds to the experience if you have thousands of people cheering it on. Um, but it, but it is, it's such a fascinating psychological thing, fake crowd noise. And I do worry perhaps when we get to the stage where a couple of thousand fans are allowed back into Premier League games, the broadcaster is going to have a choice to make. How authentic, what, what is authenticity? Are we going to keep the sound of 2000 people cheering? They might make quite a lot of noise, but it will probably sound like a a schoolboy international or something. Are they going to top it up with fake crowd noise? How are the broadcasters going to wean themselves off a product that, you know, as the game is just flowing from end to end, they feel to be the accurate depiction of what football should sound like? It's, it's not troubling. It's not, going to, it's not going to end the universe, but it is something that people are going, to, are going to have to think about. Now, fake crowd noise hasn't nailed it by any stretch. You know, when goals go in or when shots whistle wide and things like that, they, they haven't got that at all. So it'd be nice to have actual human beings responding to that. But as the game is just sort of going from end to end and you hear the crowd chants, I get the feeling they're not, they might not be able to wean themselves off for quite a while. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to see. Yeah, the, the fair crowd noise is something that I didn't think I would like at the start. But again, like you, it's just sort of a comfort blanket yeah. there. That It's not offensive. I mean, no. it, it's utterly bizarre and, and slightly concerning that we should all, or some of us feel like we, we need it and the broadcasters feel that we should, we, we should need it. But it all adds up to this authenticity of the TV football experience and the broadcasters feel like they needed it to fulfill the value of the product. And, and I, completely, I completely get why they did it. And I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's some sort of um, kind of Black Mirror style... Uh, technological dystopia by any stretch yeah it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future adam you've been brilliant with your time um Thanks if people me. want to listen to your podcast where can they find it uh yeah just i i mean uh god just google football cliches podcast um yes this is the best way to uh, uh explain it um it will be there somewhere it's on all your podcast providers spotify i find is is a very pleasant way of doing it uh, or you can go on the athletic app of course and you can listen to the the podcast without any ads which is probably the best way of doing it because uh, you don't want to hear me reading out ads for um uh what what recent adverts have been uh male grooming in a certain area that was fun to read out <laughs> Um, Actually, so, are, you, uh, are you the voice of the subscription 
pre-roll advert that plays. Oh, big startup. time! Yeah, yeah. If some for some bizarre I I reason, I put on a very voice. podcasty voice for that. <laughs> um, it's a bit more like my dad's voice when I talk a bit more like this, like a grown-up. And um, but yeah, the novelty of reading out adverts for a podcast hasn't hasn't worn off by any stretch of imagination. We're forty five uh, episodes in, and yet I still get a great thrill reading out po- uh, podcast adverts for my own uh, for my own thing. The novelty is very far from wearing off for that. Well, if you want to check out Adam's podcast again, they're available on Spotify, iTunes, the Athletic website as well. And of course, if you're looking for some Christmas reading, the Football Clichés book, I can really recommend it as well because some yeah, please do really, really brilliant stuff in there as well. Adam Hurry, thanks very much for joining me today. Cheers, Ender. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much.